Uh, so welcome everybody. I'm so excited to be the, here we are, the first program, uh, 2023 FOG. And I um, want to start just by thanking Susan Swig, who, you know, always comes up with this incredible set of programs. And it's an honor to, to be here and um, to launch this year's set of programs. Susan and I have had uh, a few years of conversations around materials, I want to say, and especially a kind of a fascination with using alternative materials from shrimp shells to different woods to mushrooms. And um, right now I have an exhibition on view at SFMOMA, conversation pieces looking at contemporary furniture, and a lot of the designers in that exhibition are really focused on materials, materiality, and so out of this, Susan and I sort of crafted a really wonderful uh, set of conversants to talk about this. Um, so let me take a minute to introduce everyone, and I don't want to get anyone's title wrong, so I've got my little cheat sheet here. <clears throat> so I'll introduce Fernando Lopez, who's uh, based in Mexico and London, uh, but a little bit more in Mexico right now. <clears throat> and who has really been researching for many years natural materials, materials he calls humble materials, materials really used for many years in sustenance and um, uh, in Mexico. And, uh, but notice that it has become so industrialized there. So in a way, it's sort of a calling, I think, that your research has really been looking at what has been lost, what materials have been lost, what craft traditions have been lost. Um, and really looking at the local condition, working in a small town, Totowitle, which I think you'll see. Oh, sorry, I should mention, everybody has five slides and they're just gonna loop and you'll see some examples of everyone's work behind us. I think we can start the slides too. <clears throat> but of interest in particular are uh, works that deal, uh, start with corn husks, uh, sisal or agave fiber and also Lufa, and one example is in uh, one of the very first booths that you see at Fog Fair. There's a um, black pup uh, bench at Sarah Myerskoff Gallery. So next, welcome Ivy Ross. Thank you. Um, designer also, vice president and head of hardware products at Google. Um, long career as a designer from jewelry to product design um, and um, ever since I've known Ivy, I know you've been a champion of sustainable materials, sustainability, especially working on that big tech campus. Really, that's been a bit of your soapbox. But I've also really, uh, more recently, come to really admire how much you've been pushing uh, design for the senses, whether it's haptic, uh, olfactory, um, uh, you know, uh, <coughs> auditory. Um, and doing a lot of research on it, and you have a new book forthcoming, Your Brain on Art, and uh, I think that might include design, too. So I really appreciate your approach to thinking about materials and the experience of those materials. <clears throat> and last but not least, welcome Eve Behar, um, designer and CEO of Fuse Project, which a uh, award-winning design firm based in San Francisco since 1999. Um, I came to know Eve through um, products in our uh, SF Moment Permanent collection. Um, ones I, I always feel that Eve is designing a product that we don't even know we need yet. Um, always kind of one step ahead in the SF Moma, of course, the wireless headphones, the health monitors, um, but oh my goodness, a range of projects head to toe. Uh, environments and um, I think a real appreciation for uh, health and well-being, uh, personal health, also societal health, from you know glasses to uh, disability design, and now moving into architectural design. So I'm really excited to uh, start a conversation with you all about material and even. Maybe even starting uh, with some terms that we hear uh, often ascribed to specific materials. Um, you know, Fernando, you have talked about humble materials, ones that are natural. We hear a lot about smart materials, um, that ones that are kind of plugged in or able to give us feedback, you know, data feedback. Um, what do you all think about these terms? What do you? 
I don't know, as we're thinking about materials in 2023, are you drawn to one or the other? Is that a um, kind of a false position to set them apart uh, as kind of opposites? Um, I don't know. A any thoughts on <laughs> those terms? Um, yeah, well, I think materials in general are, you know, besides what we use to build out of our product, it's also a way of telling us where we are, in my experience, you know. So I'm particularly attracted more to natural materials because they really speak about locality and culture. Um, and in my opinion, in a way, a lot of the sort of uh, questions that we're asking about how we produce objects in 2023 with all the related, you know, climate questions and all the changes that we're seeing in the world, for me, it's really interesting to diversify as well, almost our, our palette of materials, you know, that it's not necessarily only about, um, you know, super high tech uh, things, but it's also very low tech things that might be complementing all of these solutions. Um, yeah, so I'm, I'm particularly more drawn into, into low tech solutions, uh, particularly applied in, in the developing world, you know, but, um, I think for me, you know, it's a combination of both things. Yeah, no, I think we really have to change our definition of what premium materials are and desirable materials, because I find myself being absolutely, I started as a craftsman or craftswoman, and um, I'm hoping that as a society, we become much more attracted in the future to the natural, uh, materials and put a new definition on what's premium. Um, but most of all, the tactility, I mean, as you said, materials are the, the colors in a painting, they are the tools we work with. So this idea that I think we're really craving the tactile, because you know, we've been in a very um, flat world for a while, and so I find myself being much more drawn to, towards things that I can feel and sense are three-dimensional. And I think that will um, show up in our desire for certain materials. Oh, perfect. The slide comes up right as I'm about to speak. How is everybody? Good. Um, so materials you know, are sort of at the core of two things for I think all designers, function and emotion. And um, this is, for example, a material which was very experimental, or is very experimental. I brought a little sample if people want to touch. But this is um, wood paste. Basically, when you cut a tree for paper making or for uh, furniture or construction, 50% of that tree becomes sawdust, which clogs our water streams. is like a big problem. So this is made, this is a wood product, but it's 3D printed. So the opportunities for designers become really exciting when you take a material, natural material in this case, um, and you can create completely new forms out of wood. Com you know, it is structural, it is wood-like, um, <clears throat> but it allows a completely new experimentation, a completely new form which you couldn't shape um, out, of, out, of, um, out of traditional wood. Um, so what's interesting to me is taking these, this experimentation, which we're doing in furniture, we're doing in accessories, we're doing in, um, you know, locally, as you mentioned, um, with craft, as you mentioned, Ivy, and then seeing how we can make them, you know, behind you is a sail chair, um, how, how they can live in the industrial scale. Um, and it has to start with experimentation. It has to start in a world here where you know, it's, it's, the work lasts a long time. You know, you buy a chair, you buy a beautiful object, you buy an accessory, it will be around for a really long time. And, you know, how do we produce the things that we have to produce, the chairs, you know, the office chairs, for example, you saw the sail chair, in a way that um, is progressing towards a more environmentally conscious future. Uh, more sustainable future. And so, you know, Charles Eames and Ray Eames said, design is never done. 
the sail chair launched 10 years ago or so, yeah, 10 plus years ago. And this year we announced that it's made of ocean plastics. All of the colors, all the entire range is made out of ocean plastics. So, you know, we need to see the work. I mean, we see the work that we do is a continuum. You start, you experiment, you explore, you fail, you try new things, and then eventually, hopefully, if you keep pushing, if you're, if you're, um, you know, if you have grit and continuity in your work, hopefully, it appears. It starts appearing in the, in the mainstream, in the products that we need every day. Um, and I think that's, that's a 10 year plus, 20 year plus challenge that we have, uh, that we're working on. So I have to say, I'm really um, excited that, talk about mainstream, even in Google, you know, we're taking our fabric and making it out of recycled plastic bottles. I mean, it's so important that this happen at every scale, not just, you know, at the individual scale, but at the manufacturing. And we have to push manufacturing techniques you know, to be able to satisfy the scale that we need with some of these materials. But that's what I love about 3D printing. You know, watching it start out with only a limited amount of materials, and now they're 3D printing houses using mud in the local regions. I mean, it's a phenomenal advancement. I, I think there's an aspect that, um, of uh, a smarter approach to natural materials, um, one that doesn't deplete natural materials or create a kind of monoculture, like saw with corn in uh, Mexico, but also a smarter use of pushing industry. I know that's something, you know, that you have been, uh, is very important to your practice. You will only work with certain clients who really go back and forth with you on how something, uh, a work is made, how it's produced, um, and that that is so important too. How, how do we make things more smart? How do we work with waste? How do we incorporate waste into uh, a usable material? I mean, what's, what's been so interesting to me is that earlier in my practice, I really saw that the big players, the Googles of this world, the Herman Millers of this world, are essentially pushing a supply chain to change, to transform. Because without demand, there is no reason for material manufacturers to, 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 to invest or to you know, supply you with something different. And I saw that when, when you know, Gavin Newsom was mayor of San Francisco, we were exploring with him how to um, move you know, away from plastic bags, right? Um, and everybody was laughing at San Francisco because, oh, just San Francisco is again you know, pushing for some environmental policy that's hard or expensive to do. Um, but really the reality of what happened is by going to, in this case, Chinese suppliers of plastic bags and telling them we will only order plastic bags that are biodegradable, it suddenly created the volume and the justification that these manufacturers needed in order to invest and start to produce this material. A lot of the things we're showing you here are available, they're possible to do, but they only become a daily reality for all of us when um, the material becomes available at the right price so that the Googles of this world and the plastic trash bags makers of this world can use them. And, and it basically started a whole industry. Just having one mayor in one city say, we will sh switch from standard plastic bags to biodegradable ones created the opportunity for many other cities and many other industries to start using those. And so, you know, the responsibility is at the designer level, we need to push an experiment, but really we need allies. We need big companies to, you know, put their foot down and say, we will only get ocean plastics into our, you know, mainstream chairs. And that comes from the consumers demanding that in part. I mean, we have to absolutely put it out there, but it's been great because we do this research and I've watched people not care, you know, six years ago, and then the switch in the last six years, it's just ammunition, it's fantastic, you know, that for consumers to say, we do care, we are gonna say, we're not spending our money here, we are spending it there. So I think that's a part of the equation. So I would just encourage everyone to think about that when you're making decisions. And maybe Fernando, you can speak about your 
collaboration with kind of the source, the farmer, the, 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 where the material even starts. Um, yeah, I guess my, my practice is radically different in that sense because, um, you know, I think it's, it's interesting as well how um, designers and especially young designers as well, we have the, the ability to perhaps also diversify how a lot of these solutions can happen. Because, for example, you know, I live in a radically different environment than here, you know. So, so for example, it's, it's hard for us to have a whole fleet of 3D printers printing things, you know. Or very organized waste management to concentrate resources in there. You know, so the Mexican reality is we have a lot of people, people desperate for work, uh, very environmental, like, environmental problems that are very linked to the land itself, you know, so problems like erosion, problems like um, a lot of the traditional agriculture basically being uprooted and replaced by a way of agriculture that is uh, very destructive. So uh, in my case, it's more about, you know, really working directly with the core, you know. So what I do is I work with an indigenous community in the, in the south of Mexico. And what we've been doing over the past eight years is reintroducing a lot of the ancient varieties of corn and agave, right? So this, this is all about finding uh, rather labor-intensive ways of, of transforming what some might consider waste, but I consider it, you know, our prime material and our prime reason for reintroducing these varieties. Um, and then slowly trans, you know, working them and through craft, really transforming them into final objects, you know. But I guess at the end of it, uh, it's really looking at what design can do in terms of really closing a circle um, and really focusing more than sustainability on regeneration. So how, how so for example, this image is about all the um, efforts that we've done to revert erosion by creating green barriers uh, using agave, you know. Agave is this amazing plant that grows basically on rocks with no soil, no water, uh, much quicker than a tree. Um, and it's looking at really, it's looking at reforestation and flipping it on its head because when you think of reforestation, you think of trees and you think of forests. So this is a way of reforesting in areas that are about to become a desert, you know? And then it's not enough just planting things. It's also finding ways at creating industries and sources of revenue locally so that people keep on maintaining these uh, investments and efforts, you know? So I think for me, it's really interesting to see how craft and design can become the engine behind these things. And I guess at the end of the day, it's about, yeah, it's about changing also at the consumer level, what people are really asking for, you know? So what, what we try to do is to have total transparency, you know? It's like, this is what we're doing in this village with these people, and we do it all, and it ends in final product, you know? And I think this is a way of, yeah, maybe tracing a new path also for consumers to be demanding this kind of hyper-transparency, uh, which I think is really interesting, because at the end of the day, what we do as designers is create desire, you know, like we, we trade in desire. So we can just shift a little bit of that desire from, yeah, let's buy something new every month and dispose of it to let's ask for something that perhaps is very labor intensive, but I will cherish it forever and never throw it away. Then maybe it's another avenue as well, you know. Do you have um, other craftsmen that make things with you or are you the only maker once you use these materials? No, so I, I, the idea is to not go and work with existing craftspeople. We, we work with farmers, you know, like they, they've never crafted anything in their lives. And so what we do is design a whole series of processes and, and, and techniques so that they can become craftspeople really quickly and we have a certain quality control. And so, yeah, I'm always the the beta tester of the system, you know? But once it starts to work, uh, we, you know, we have a workshop directly in their village and that's where everything gets made, you know? So it's really about also situating yourself as a designer at the source of things, you know? So for example, over the pandemic, I spent 
almost five months living with them in the village, and that's where a lot of these kind of processes and things uh, really came to fruition, you know, because you really have to be there to and then figure it out. you set them up so that they could be self-sustaining? Yeah, so for example, I mean, for me, you know, like working with indigenous people, what I feel it's really interesting is that they're really affected by global changes, uh, a, global, a global trade in which they're never part of, but they're very deeply affected by it. Uh, and they don't get any access to the advantages of that, you know? So I guess what we try to do is to, yeah, set up a whole production where everything can be done in, in their village. You know, we still help them with orders and all the, all the trading of it, but what we do at the end of, you know, every month, we, we send them FedEx barcodes, you know, and, and they take all these products to the nearest FedEx town. <laughs> And that gets shipped all over, you know? So it's also looking at, like, you know, there are some things that are very practical about being in a global community, you know? And so we're trying to bridge that gap, trying to marry uh, tradition and innovation, in a way. I want an agave phone cover. We'll have to, we'll have to work that out. Uh, yes. <laughs> it does seem for um, each condition in which you, you all live or have it work um, that I would say uniquely you have uh, each become involved so much in the process uh, of how a product is, I don't know, sourced, made, and, and the um, even talked about. And um, that seems really important today. And I, I want to talk a little bit about what you mentioned, desire, creating desire, because I think an, an aspect that uh, while you, you each have different approaches, there is a sense for me from each of you of uh, a joy and a passion of what you do. And uh, there's a, definitely a seriousness to it as well. But I think there's uh, something about imparting some of that passion and joy in the products themselves. And I'd, I'd love to hear from each of you a kind of desired outcome of when, when you launch something uh, out. So <laughs> it's become clear for me a long time ago that selling green or selling sustainability um, just doesn't work. You know, you need to present people with something beautiful, something desirable at the right price, um, <clears throat> something that really delivers a connection. So that's all design. Um, and then, yeah, it happens to be, you know, it happens to be made in, out of a different sourcing or a different production, you know, cycle. And uh, to me, those are the biggest victories when you're not trying to convince people, forcing them into a moral choice with guilt or <laughs> other <laughs> devices. Um, <coughs> uh, and, and you really sort of, presenting them with a better choice. I'll, I'll use, you know, SodaStream, for example, which we helped, you know, rebuild and launch a few years ago. And, you know, it's like, well, we made it fun. We made it, you know, it's nice in the kitchen. It makes a funny noise. We get, you know, there is pleasure. You need to derive pleasure. Uh, th the one thing I realized a few years ago is like the human brain is not wired for long-term thinking. We're not. We're wired to, for pleasure. This is the way we were built. What are you thinking about right now? The next meal, the next party, the next drink, the next cool, beautiful object that you, know, that, um, you can get here. That's what you're thinking about. Scientists and artists have been telling us for 40 years that the events of the last couple of months that we've all experienced in Europe or in the US are, are going to happen. We didn't think about it that much, right? Um, we didn't plan for it because that's not the way we're wired. We probably should have, but that's not the way our brains are wired. So if our, if our brains are wired for pleasure, we need to deliver pleasure with all of the sort of future responsibilities that we have at the same time. And that's really what's made, um, you know, what's, what's how we change behavior, how we bring people to different conclusions, how we create conscious consumption. 
Actually, that's okay. You could probably tell which is my slide. It has the watch and the phone, but it's all very beautiful and soft. Um, and I work with a large, talented group of designers. And we all aligned many years ago when we started around this idea of design feeling versus design thinking. And it's been wonderful because now when the designers finish an object or a piece or we take pride in the fact that our Wi-Fi looks like a glass vase and not like a Wi-Fi object. Um, we, a we ask them, what do you want the person to feel when they first see it? And then when we do consumer research, we look at this word cloud, and it's so exciting when you see how people emotionally, when they see something, will say the exact word most of the time, not all the time, that the designer had hoped they would feel when they felt the object or saw the object. So I think um, we all have our different ways of trying to impart that on what we make. Um, but it's been great that we're even, that becomes a mark of success in part with some of our products is have we ma matched up uh, the intention? Because I do believe that I once did an experiment um, when I was at Mattel Toys, and I do think the consumer feels the energy in which an object is made. You know, they can feel, it gets transmitted mm -hmm. in terms of the way something was made, who made it, um, whether they were, what they were making it with, and I think we're getting um, more sensitive to that, not only visually, but tactily and even energetically. Yeah, I mean, I think I, I agree with Eves in the sense that, you know, a lot of how you communicate a product nowadays regarding sustainability, you know, it's uh, the worst you can do is like guilt trip people into feeling bad <laughs> than by it, you know. So for me, it's everything's a negotiation. So you're negotiating with someone a new way of living and consuming. And the worst thing that you can do in, when you're negotiating someone with something is to be really aggressive, you know, and <laughs> that's, that's not how you're going to get any, anything out of it. So I think with what I tried to do is, is really presenting an alternative way of producing and living, you know, because, yes, I think even though most, most people are hardwired for, for pleasure, there are still people in the world that aren't, you know. I, the people that I work with just have a completely different way of seeing the world. So, you know, I, I'm, I'm always being asked, like, should we change from human-focused design uh, human-centered design, sorry, to nature-centered design. And, and in a way, I think, yes, that would be nice, but not really, because a lot of our current problems regarding material sustainability, etc., they're all human problems, you know? And so I think it's, it's remaining within human-centered design, but perhaps diversifying who we're designing for, you know? So in my case, perhaps we don't focus so much about how many products we're selling towards the end of it, because probably the, the, the core of the project is about how much environmental impact and social impact we're doing at the production source, you know? So I think a lot of these negotiations are also by presenting a new language, a new physical language. Uh, and that's why I think I'm very excited with this kind of resurgence of craft as a, as, as a viable way of dressing your life, you know? Um, and for example, it doesn't necessarily mean that it has to be a very expensive thing. And I'll give you a, a, an excellent example. Um, so Ikea just opened in Mexico um, two years ago, right? And everyone was really dreading what that was gonna bring to local furniture and, and, and craft production. And I don't think they're doing very well. Like, you know, you go to their website and they're missing a bunch of stuff. I mean, it ha also has to do with supply chains, et cetera. But IKEA is very careful with how they do their market research and what, uh, what objects they offer in what country. And it's really interesting to see that IKEA has absolutely no baskets available in, in, the, in the Mexico branch. <laughs> Why? Because there are basket makers in every corner. And there's no way that they will ever be able to compete with that. And I think. You know, Mexico is a really interesting place because I think that's where the battle with between industry and craft is being is being kind of fought. Or I mean, it's not a battle, but that negotiation is being is being uh, articulated there. Um, and and I think you know I, I see a kind of a bright future in that regard. Like objects that are 
closer to nature both in materiality and in the way they are produced and the impact that it have in people, you know, because I don't know, I, I, I'm not particularly fond of a future where everything is made by a machine, you know? Like I think we still need that human touch uh, to feel good with our objects. I, I think we see that throughout the fair. Um, the handmade is so apparent, but I mean, I also think, Eve, you're also making a case that there is a way to work with industry, um, but as designers, you're kind of in a great position to push industry to, you know, not kind of box out uh, artisans, crafts people, designers really embrace it. <clears throat> I mean, I think we all, as designers, we all have a love affair with craft. Ivy was yeah. doing jewelry. I have a whole other practice that is not shared, <coughs> um, which is working with craftsmen uh, in Portugal, for example. Um, it is, it is, and, and what we do every day is crafting methodologies, shapes, you know, in, in, in our office. So I think, I think sort of craft and the dedication to craft is a through line through all design. Um, and design is multidimensional, so you can find it here next to incredible art. You can find it in the supermarket um, and with everything in between. And I think we, you, you, you just can't deny that your consumption is going to touch all those parts. You're gonna buy toilet paper one day and one day you're gonna buy you know, an incredible chair um, and with everything in between. And there's no doubt in my mind, and I've said this for a really long time, that every industry will need to transform itself, including IKEA. Um, and it's just a matter of when you're starting and how far you're going to go. And that's a, that's a matter of leadership, it's a matter of um, intent, um, it's, it's, and that intent is perceived. And eventually, I think, all industries will have transformed themselves, all processes will have transformed themselves. I would like to see it accelerated. Mm -hmm. I would like you, the users, to be more vocal. I would like politicians to be more, um, to take you know, stronger steps because regulation and enforcement is absolutely critical if you want to protect anything. Um, and I would like, you know, I would like us to be given more opportunities, more permissions, more, um, um, you know, more openings into um, into making that change, because it's it's not boring. It's actually really interesting. It's actually really fascinating. It's really what where design thrives is in change. And I think we are. I mean, I often say, you know, design accelerates the adoption of ideas. And the idea of the 21st century is to move us to an economy that is more in line with nature and to uh, a type of con you know, consumption that will be um, beneficial to Earth rather than, than take away from it. That's, I, don't, I cannot think of a bigger challenge and a bigger transformation and a bigger opportunity uh, ahead of us. Yeah, and you know, I think design is about solving problems and all along from the pure craft all the way up to high manufacturing production, there are problems to be solved. And, we, and if we all do it with that thoughtful um, craftsmanship mentality, I think that's how over time we'll, we'll change things. I think that this idea of bioengineering in design is super interesting and um, because there's gonna be both how do we use and regenerate materials and then how do we create new materials or engineer new materials that um, are very different than the ones we, we're used to. So I see a lot of hope in that concept of designers and scientists working together to create whole new materials that we can't even imagine today. Yeah, I think, um um, you mentioned politicians, you know, and I think that's, that's something that is incredibly important with design. Design is always political, and design is always reacting to the current, you know, situation and every point in history. Um, 
So for example, in, in, in part of what we do in, in the project with, with this village is also to evidence a lot of the shortcomings of our political strategies of how to solve a lot of these issues, you know? So, for example, um, a lot of the reforestation that we're doing with agaves, no? we, were, we were being consulted by someone that was really looking into, can we, for example, access um, carbon neutralizing credits, you know, to, to get funding through companies and all that stuff. Um, you know, agave is this incredible plant. It like fixes so much carbon into into the soil. Yeah, maybe not as much as a big Canadian tree, you know, or a tree in the Amazon. But these trees don't grow in this region, you know. And this this, this is the best alternative here. Um, currently, there's absolutely no models uh, for funding any of this um, because no one's really looking at at, at these areas, you know. Um, it, it just doesn't look as green and as lush and as pretty, you know, for, for a poster, for a company, or for, for a government, you know. And the most ridiculous thing that happened, for example, was that uh, this reforestation project was started by the government with fundings from private companies. And what they did is they planted pine trees. This was in the desert, right? <laughs> so there's this big plaque at the end of the mountain saying, like, you know, this program helped plant, like, I don't know, X amount of trees. And that's the problem, you know. At the end of the day, it's, um, it's a lot about misinformation, about lack of transparency. And so what we're trying to do is to say, okay, we also need to diversify um, what we are asking from our governments and, and from our corporations. And I think by communicating that to the consumer, to the general public, it's not necessarily about selling them, you know, a corn piece or an agave piece, but maybe getting them to think more about this because that can eventually translate into votes, you know, into public demand, into things that eventually become real tangible things, you know, and, and perhaps it wasn't about selling a million objects, you know, it was more about just pushing these ideas the right way. I like uh, what you were saying, Ivy, about kind of the imperfection of the language that we've been using so long, and, and I think all of you have just made a big case that that opposition between craft and design no longer exists. Maybe it never existed and um, doesn't need to be um, fostered. Um, one last question for me before we open it up. Evie, you said the biggest challenge uh, ahead is one that you're really excited about. I was wondering if each of you might share one, one passion project uh, that has your attention right now <coughs> as it relates well, to material. <laughs> sure. Um, well, we, we're, we're doing really interesting work in what I would say completely expected categories or completely unchallenged categories. Shampoo, <laughs> for example. Um, and I love these types of challenges because these are, these are things that we, we're not even thinking about. We're, we're doing blindly, right? We're using blindly. Um, so, but it's also very humbling <laughs> because you know, you're trying to transform things that are just um, uninteresting <laughs> until you do it, until, you're, until you deliver a new, a new experience, and it has to be successful because if not, there is no transition. Um, that's one area. The other area is remedial projects like the Ocean Cleanup, for example, which started in Holland and San Francisco, and you can see they're, they're, they're pulling out hundreds of tons of, um, of plastic out of the ocean. This is buoyant slat um, with some of the sorting that happens. Um, but, but, you know, demonstrating that what we call trash is not tra trash. It's beautiful, it's structural, it needs, it, it needs to be reused. And at the same time, by reusing it, we're pulling that material from the ocean where it really shouldn't be in the first place. Um, so remedial projects are important. They're not, hopefully when we, you know, 20 years from now, we don't have plastic in the oceans and it's not, you know, it, this project doesn't make sense. But for now, we need it. We need to kind of uh, clean things up. And then I'm also really excited about some, um, some more ambitious types of projects that use, um, you know, the future of the transportation, for example, and mobility um, that we're working on and we'll be presenting in, a, in six weeks or so. So, you know, there's, 
thought we were going to hear about the secret Portuguese project. <laughs> well, I can show that to you. Next year. Um, but, but yeah, there, I, I don't know. There's so much work to be done. Um, and I think, I think for me, it's always been really exciting to look at things also that are just not on the radar, that nobody is really addressing that we take for granted. Um, and that's been probably the biggest rewards of, of, of the work I've been doing for the last 30, 30 plus years is seeing some of these categories change. And people go, oh, maybe I don't need to purchase that San Pellegrino by the case. Um, I can just do it myself at home. By the way, if any of you invites me to your homes, I do give I do give a little bit of guilt guilt and bad looks if you if you pull out San Pellegrino out. <laughs> Just letting you know in advance. <laughs> so um, because with the scale of products we make, we can't always use natural materials, but what we can do in the design studio is to be inspired by them. So we're doing a pet project of mine and some of the designers at work are, uh, we're doing a exhibition at Milan Salone, which is called Shaped by Water. And again, if you see in the images, um, even our watch that we just came out with was literally created by watching the way water drops on a steel plate and the beautiful shape that is formed. And so, We've used water kind of as our muse, and if you look at some of our products, the, the radius and the way they're shaped has come from studying water. So this experience we're creating in Milan is going to be one that really celebrates water as um, everything that she does for us, including one of the slides that is circulating that looks like two circles of pattern. That is um, my voice underwater translated into a pattern. So this idea that, you know, we're 60% water, and so the vibrations of the music we listen to, the talking to each other, is literally creating these beautiful um, crystalline structures and patterns in our body. So that is celebrating water in another way, in terms of how important it is, not only as inspiration, but what it's doing for us uh, in every moment. So there'll be some experiences where you'll be able to see when music is played through water, the patterns that are formed. So that's um, a pet project. And of course, the book um, was a pet project uh, called Your Brain on Art, which is really my co-authors from Johns Hopkins. And it's, you know, neuroscience is now catching up with all of us artists and creatives have known for years that um, art and aesthetic experiences absolutely affects our health and well-being. And I think we've been optimizing for productivity since the Industrial Revolution and pushing some of those sensorial things aside, thinking we'd be healthy and we're not. And I think it's time we bring those back big time and honor them. And that's really what um, that project was about. Um, well, with me, I mean, the project that we're doing in this village, for me, it's a life project. So, you know, we have yearly plantations, we have yearly goals that we do about expanding the area that we're reforesting. So that, that's, always, that's always there, for sure. Um, but we have been working over the past three years on a new project regarding avocado, the avocado industry, and all, this, all its dark side. <laughs> So <laughs> that's a bit of a guild project, <laughs> but uh, oh, there is a dark side to avocado. There's a terrible, terrible dark side to it. Yeah. So, uh, well, in Mexico, it's very linked to violence, very linked to deforestation. Um, we're working with the rangers of the Monarch Butterfly Sanctuary, uh, which are in a constant war, basically, against uh, the foresters, avocado growers, etc. So this will culminate in a big exhibition at the end of this year, a documentary and, and a new material uh, that we're working on. So that's exciting. Yeah. Thank you for sharing this. <laughs> um, I think we wanted to open up for questions from the audience, if there are any. Someone's going to come around with a mic. Thank you, Mom. 
Um, there, it's super exciting to hear about all the materials that you're working with. And I've worked on a number of residential projects where I've been lucky to have clients who really cared about all the materials. So I've been able to be involved or at least, you know, watch the amount of information that can be dug up on what you do and don't want to use just in a residential project if budget isn't the only criteria. Um, but I'm just curious, there are so many different companies or institutions that evaluate products but it's kind of overwhelming. So even a company like Chillowitch, which I just cringe because I think everything they make is made out of vinyl, which is really not a good material. But like, do you have any simple ways of how people can just generally look at products and materials and feel like, oh, this one's okay. Or like you go to the Chillowitch website and they're like, we have a great environmental product and it's not, you know? So it's just, it's frustrating because there is so much greenwashing out there? Like, is there some, just any tips you guys might have? Just, just to make sure uh -huh. we understand the qu uh, question, uh, any tips for users or consumers of like how to know just visually or get a sense of a product and uh, if, it, if it feels like it uh, has good, good backstory behind it and how it was made? Because there, there's like <coughs> red list yeah. and a, there's a, a lot of different, you know, yeah, I, that's a very tough one, and and I agree with you. It is very hard as a as a consumer to sort of pick through um, products and makers and 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 you know trust maybe or or understand you know what what the advantages or disadvantages of a certain production is. I would I would go to companies who have been doing it for a long time. I mean, I'll, I'll give a shout out to Herman Miller because it has been a 30 plus year pursuit on their part to, um, to, to specify, to uh, work with cradle to cradle, to measure, test um, their materials. And, um, you know, I would, I, I think going to, you know, reliable sources is a good idea. As a designer, I try to support small makers as well. Um, and that becomes, they don't have the funds, they don't have the, um, the, um, the ability really to, um, to sort of fully test you know, their claims. They, they're doing their best in their sourcing. Um, so it's, um, yeah, it's, it's, it's a very tough landscape to navigate as a consumer and I wish there were better measuring tools, better um, official, you know, kind of labeling out there, but it doesn't it doesn't exist yet. I think you need to look for Europe for for a much more thorough um, look at the way industrial products, for example, now have to be all taken back and recycled by the manufacturers. So, um, one criteria for me that's critical. You mentioned kids is the amount of off-gassing, the amount of chemicals that you're, that you're putting in a room in an environment. Um, and I have a bunch of experiences there um, and a bunch of um, conclusions there, which is secondhand will be much better than firsthand <laughs> when it comes to furnishing a kid's room, for example. But those are very simple principles. I think you mentioned Europe, and I think we're starting to see that circular design symbol uh, permeate uh, even beyond Europe as, as a, a kind of regulation of how something was uh, made. Did it, you know, use remediation? Did it <clears throat> responsibly use the materials? So maybe, as Fernanda was saying, working with the politicians to help the consumer make those choices just through a, an icon or a symbol. Um. Another question? Okay. Good afternoon, uh, Sonia Scavarla. It's nice to meet you and um, spend time in conversation with you this afternoon. Uh, my question is regarding the time that is increasingly spent by people in digital spaces and how you think about materials showing up in digital spaces to then connect us to the physical world. You mean you mean in the virtual, the sort of materiality of virtual spaces? Yes. Oh, Ivy, <laughs> our brain. <laughs> I think we need to balance that with walks in nature. Um, 
you know, nature is the most neuroaesthetic place there is. It enlivens everything in our body, a sense of smell, texture, color, temperature. Um, but there are some amazing things in the digital world, um, i.e., even this is an example of the digital world. When you can immerse yourself and your brain believes that you're in certain places, it communicates to your body as if you're in those places. So there are some, I know, for example, they're using in hospitals for pain management, VR headsets for burn victims with the VR being in, um, a la in an igloo setting, freezing cold, and actually they become pain free. So it's really interesting to me, it remains to be seen, because there, there are advantages to jumping into a, a world where you can be uh, transported or stimulated, your senses being stimulated. Um, for me personally, I think we need to um, be accountable for our own balancing of counteracting that with taking a walk in nature. But I think it's an incredibly creative time, quite frankly, and I'm someone that it's not either or, it's both and. I think there's, there'll be good um, within both domains, and I, both areas, and I believe that I'm interested in technology that amplifies our humanity, doesn't take us out of it. So for me, it remains to be seen is how will some of these new digital technologies amplify our humanity or make us more creative? I think it's too early to tell, but I think it's worth exploring. Yeah, I mean, I, I've heard that, for example, even artificial plants within a, a space environment already makes us more peaceful, you know? So just the image of a plant, you know, and perhaps this is not, Coming from the digital world, it's it's IRL, but it's a it's a mimicking of nature, you know. And at the end of the day, no matter how much we want to become digital creatures, we're we're animals, you know. We want that. And uh, I don't know. My question is also like, you know, it's it's forecasted that in 50 years, I think like most of the people of the world will live in in mega cities, you know. The 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 migration pattern has been always from the countryside to the city uh, and, 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 and even to deeper and deeper urban realities, which is now bordering and are we even here, you know? Um, so, for example, if you look at the pandemic, that was a major, like, handbrake to that crazy train. And, and for the first time ever, you had a reverse migration in, back into nature. And if you hear about the experiences of all the people through the pandemic, you either... <laughs> hear like total anxiety through computers or a reconnection and, and, and peacefulness with nature, you know? So, you know, I'm more of the belief of like, perhaps, you know, also looking at distancing ourselves from that because for me, it really goes against who we are at, at our core, you know? And I think the more people that go back to nature, um, the less of the crazy, silly consumption we're going to have as well, you know? It's the easiest thing for companies to sell us things is if we're, like, just clicking all day. So you're playing, you're communicating, yeah, and then click, you buy something, and then click, you buy something. So, so I think, uh, for me, I would, I would choose distancing from the digital world, personally, you know? Hi. Hi. Oh, are you Here. Can I? Um, thank you for the talk. Um, so uh, one of the points in common that I found was um, kind of connecting to the objects that we have for understanding their origin stories and their sourcing. Um, and, I th and I think that's very important. Um, I don't know if you heard that, but I think like one of the things that I found appealing about the talk is that we connect to the objects by understanding their sourcing and their, their origin story. But one point of difference that I found is that Fernando, for example, said that, you know, his experience is producing labor-intensive objects that we keep with us for a long time. And I think the permanence on those objects in our lives also affects the connection that we have with them. And um, so I guess this is a question for Ivy. Like, do you, given that, you know, you work with uh, consumer electronics, do you foresee a future where we get to keep our objects for longer than two years? Um, because th that product cycle and having batteries inside these objects uh, and having 
having to evolve the capabilities of those objects over and over seems to kind yeah, of Yeah, that's them. already, I think we are, most of us in these industries are looking, and certainly we are in changing that, and I think that will happen over time for a number of reasons, you know, due to the, the waste it creates. I mean, we're all looking at, when I say we all, I think the electronic industry, but all looking at how to build things differently, build them so they can last longer, repair, being repaired in a way that enables you to hold on to things longer. Um, yeah, I think there's a real heightened awareness to that. And I think it's gonna affect that industry. It already is starting to. Um, because I do agree with you. I mean, my house is filled with, it's the contrast of opposites, you know, a basket I got in South America that has memories for me and a piece of technology that is truly helpful to me in what I do every day. But I, you know, this tension of opposites is interesting and I think they're gonna learn from each other over time. I think one, one um, I've, I've, I've um, designed plenty of my, my own share of electronics and one thing that I've noticed is that when it doesn't have a screen, it lasts longer. So our watches, our cell phones are very short-lived, but the technologies that I use in my home, which I like to be invisible personally, I like technology to be invisible and in the background, tend to last longer. I, you know, they, they <clears throat> and so I think part of the answer may also be in breaking the paradigm that everything we connect with has to be through a screen, that there's other ways to interact, other ways to connect, other ways to, um, to have technology around us be useful um, without being in front of a backlit, uh, essentially, uh, screen device. I think there's one last question. Yes. Yeah. Okay. Um, so I was wondering, um, and this was first inspired by looking at like the recycled ocean plastic, but I think this could apply to all of your guys' materials. Um, but I was wondering what kind of research and planning you do to ensure that like the pl the plastic objects you're making don't end up back in the ocean or don't end up back in an unsustainable system. Um, you know, once their useful life is transformed from what you've created? So, so for example, we, um, in terms of research and, and sort of being thorough, um, we use often third party um, evaluation firms, sustainability evaluation firms on several different continents that um, evaluate the true uh, life cycle of what we're making. And it's, n it's rarely about going to zero, to be truthful, but it's always about improvement. Like the sail chair uses 30 to 40, and, and before it became a, um, a recycled plastic uh, product, is using 30% less materials, less carbon footprint than, than other things. The, the Puma Clever Little Bag, the shoe box we did for Puma, was at 50% the amount of diesel, the amount of materials, et cetera. So we're, we're bringing these kind of uh, amounts to, to lower levels. And that is my answer when somebody goes, well, why do you need another chair? There's enough chairs in the world. Um, well, we actually need to produce more chairs because we need to put more people there's more people, there's more offices that are opening, there's more. And so, do we want to manufacture the chairs of, that were conceived 20, 30 years ago? Do we want to drive the cars from the 70s? Or do we want to uh, move to um, a much more efficient um, uh, you know, uh, solution? And it's, it's incremental, it's incremental uh, progress, I guess. Um, and um, I don't know if that answers, you know, sort of part of your, of your question, but then if the labeling, for example, on this chair is correct, the, the, um, the, the material comes from the right source and can be recycled, 
then companies like Google that may have that chair um, will work with Herman Miller on turning it back, bringing it back into the, um, the you know, into the, into, in, back to its source, back to its, um, back to a, a, a material that can be broken down. And I think that is, you know, you look at this chair and what I'm sure, I'm pretty sure you don't know, you don't think about is, it's actually, it has a 12 year warranty on it. That's more than my car. <laughs> it's more than any other object I'm familiar with. And so it really requires companies to think of their products differently. And I, again, I said in Europe, you are now forced uh, in most industries to, as a company, to take back the entire production and break it back down and, and put it back in the, um, in the production cycle. So these measures are happening, maybe not fast enough, maybe not everywhere in the same way. It needs to happen in the US. We're far, we're far from it um, in the political environment that we live in. <laughs> um, but there are solutions and there is a direction. We just need to really take it and move forward. And, and I think an aspect is, in, in, in kind of summary of all of this, it's a good question of um, we, we can't ensure really what happens. But having these conversations and um, hearing from designers who are really invested in how how materials are made, invested in asking those tough questions of the politicians, of uh, you know, the clients. Um, I know each of you have kind of held back a product because it wasn't quite um, you know, up to whatever standard um, it was, but it's, um, it's a moment, and I'm just gonna kind of paraphrase what you all have said, it's a moment of change, and, uh, but design can change behavior, and hopefully it's the you know, behavior of all of us that would shift exactly what you would like to see is like n no waste in, in the end, right? Um, and I don't want to sacrifice, you know, what we have also talked about, uh, the importance of creativity and art and passion, too, because there is, I think, Eve, you underlined it, there's the here and now, and we have to enjoy also each other and, and here and now, and, um, you know, a lot of the work that you have been presenting uh, does just that, but it also gets us thinking about the future, too. Yeah. Susan, I think do you want to close it out. Oh, sorry, I was saying we have. Uh, John, so <laughs> could could I just say like uh, yes, just please. one thing please. I want to add to the plastic thing very quickly, but um, like, I don't I don't work with plastic, but um, if you like I've been part of a lot of plastic cleanup uh, exercises in Mexico, and you you pick up that plastic, and it has labels from Central South America, some even from Asia, right? That plastic is not local plastic. It, this is a world problem. And if you look at it, a lot of, you know, I was just really looking at these labels. And it made me think about the, the village where I work in. So, for example, we have a real crisis of diabetes, of alcoholism, because all of these companies are just selling soda and beer bottles and all these things and introducing plastics to areas where there's not even trash collection, you know. So what do these people do? I mean, like, we, we, we're, we're just throwing plastics at them. And if you look at a lot of the source of the ocean plastic, it comes from places where there's such drastic inequalities that we don't even have, you know, the right tools to deal with the masses of plastic that we sell to them. So I think for me, it's, it's you know, the, the sustainability and, and ecological crisis is really a crisis of inequality at the end of the day, you know? So it's a combination of looking at new materials, yes, looking at how we recycle them, but also how do we breach and narrow that inequality gap because, you know, that's, that's for me a major, major source of the problem. Um, so, you know, just a thought. <laughs> yeah, good. Agree. So we have John. Uh, thank you. Oh. oh. Are you going to go or? Hey, John, go ahead. Uh, yeah, my name is John Randolph, and uh, I want to thank you for this great topic today. And uh, I have a question directed to Eve, and that is, could you speak to the leap from making intimate objects to 3D printed buildings? And also, just um, kind of how you see the future of that technology 
moving ahead? Well, 3D, 3D printing has been a core part of uh, a typical industrial designer's practice for 30 years. Um, before architects, John is an architect, so I'm going to tease him. Before architects used it. Um, <clears throat> and it's been sort of uh, used in prototyping mostly. And now we're seeing it um, used more in the sense of distributed manufacturing or going towards distributed manufacturing, which when you think about objects being made in one singular place and then shipped all over the world, um, you can Im immediately imagine the carbon footprint, the amount of diesel, shipping, etc., cetera, that, that packaging that goes into that. If you can make things uh, locally in a distributed fashion through 3D printing, then you're cutting down on that, on that uh, carbon footprint dramatically. So that's one, one thing that I think a lot of young companies are exploring is distributed manufacturing. It's very hard, but there are, there are people exploring it. Um, 3D printing or prefabs are very important, in my opinion, in the building industry uh, because so much waste is created on site. Um, and when you prefab a building or parts of a building, you're cutting down on the noise, waste, transportation, trucks coming in and out of a certain site. So I think, I think there is great hope and there is great uh, cutting of, um, of, of, of waste uh, in that area. 3D printing is interesting as well if you can use local materials and we experimented with a, with a charity um, called New Story which, uh, w w who is building essentially housing for people who make less than $200 um, a month, so essentially families that are homeless. Um, and specifically actually in Mexico, the one we're showing here we built in, uh, in Mexico. And it's still an experiment, but I think my sense is that 10 years from now, probably half of a building, even a, even a, um, even a, um, uh, a skyscraper, about half of a building can be made through prefab, which is more efficient um, and uh, allows for um, for less use of materials and less waste. So there is positive there. We're experimenting with it. Um, there's a lot more work to do there. <clears throat> do you want to you you close, wanna... Susan? <laughs> I, I really want to thank all of you for your participation today, for this dream conversation, for your incredible stories for bringing your work forward, for your perspectives, and for offering us this lens that we can all take forward in designing our own lives, in designing the world that we'd like to see that will be a better world, and um, just for the humanity of it all. So I'm incredibly grateful, and I just wanted to cl close it out with that. Thanks. Thank you. Thank, Thank you.